Well, welcome everybody to our, let's see, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, fourth, <laughs> fourth of five presentations as part of A Week with the Arts. I so appreciate you all joining us today and some of you who have been able to participate in all these presentations. It's really been a fun week. Um, you know, after a year of pandemic, you hear online program and everyone kind of deflates, but this has been very different and it's, it's been a lot of fun for us too. So thank you for being here. I wanna thank our sponsors. Um, we really could not do events like this without our sponsors. They, they really give us the, um, the financial support to know that we can pull these kinds of things off. And of course, this support also contributes to our 2021 programming. Um, so we appreciate this group very much. Um, this is a fundraiser for our exhibitions and programs in 2021. We typically have our, our gala at this time of year, and it just gives us um, a nice boost to start the year um, of funding so that we know we're on, on strong footing as we kick things off. So um, this event in particular will generate around 10 to 15% of our annual um, funding for programming. And of course, our programs all support our mission to improve quality of life through art. And um, so you can see there in the left-hand picture, our Clyde Butcher, America the Beautiful exhibition. Um, that exhibition is so neat to experience just to be in the gallery. It's very soothing and meditative. It also makes you feel like you're traveling when you can't right now with the pandemic. Um, but it really shows the power of art to transport us to different places and to make us feel different things. In this case, to feel the healing and serenity from our natural environment. Um, that picture underneath our mission is our new Teen Art Council program. That is one of several new programs we started last year during the pandemic. And that is Anissa working with students from Gadsden County High School and they learned about, initially learned about the work in our Hoffman to Warhol exhibition, but they've been designing programming to engage students from the larger high school with our museum. It's been a, a super successful program. These are really engaged students. Some of them are very gifted in visual art. Um, we're excited to be entering the second year of that program this year. So those are just two examples of many of how we improve quality of life through art. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Beth Allman. And Beth, we are so grateful to you for doing this presentation. I know that you and all of our speakers have devoted a, an enormous amount of time to preparing your presentations for us. And you're so generous to share your talent and expertise in this area. Um, Beth earned her bachelor's degree of art at Virginia Tech and her master's degree in English literature at Florida State University. She's been weaving and teaching basketry for over 35 years. Beth creates handwoven baskets in all shapes and sizes, and she restores furniture through the tr traditional art of caning. I recently had Beth do a chair for me, an old Hitchcock chair, and it, it just came back to life. It's beautiful. Um, Beth is fascinated with the ability to make three-dimensional containers or other items that can be used in our everyday lives. In recent years, she added willow to her skills to make traditional European willow trays, baskets, and other items. Many also using natural features indigenous to the South. She says chair caning is a passion in progress. Um, of her craft, Beth says, the ability to produce woven heirloom, heirloom items allows me to connect with the past and preserve our craft heritage. Welcome Beth Allman. Thank you, Grace. I appreciate being asked to share my love of basket making and show you a little bit about what I do. Uh, that is right, I did start with an art degree and I went home and my father said to me, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'd like to paint dad. And he said, you know, you drive a Volkswagen Bug and I don't think your car is big enough for ladders. So I took that as the idea that perhaps I ought to find something where I could support myself through some sort of vocation. Um, and not long after that, I became apprenticed with a fiber artist. Uh, she did make art using different kinds of fibers. A lot of it was hay baling twine, or, yeah, the, the baling twine on fencing. So that was interesting. 
Um, but I was fascinated with the looms. And so I started working on the looms, making useful utilitarian items. It was, it was just fascinating to me. And I don't have a lot of patience, so I love doing the big rag rugs and anything that was sort of big and chunky that I could really get into and work on. Um, I later learned how to make baskets and, and it wasn't much later. I was asked to teach at an art camp in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. And I honestly don't remember what I was supposed to teach because that weekend, someone came up for, from Virginia Commonwealth as another teacher. And I said, what are you gonna teach this weekend or this week at art camp? And she says, I'm going to teach baskets. And I said, well, that sounds great. How do you do that? She says, I have no idea. I brought these books. So we sat down that weekend and we worked through the books and we taught ourselves how to make baskets. And after that, I was definitely bit by the bug. Um, I've been making baskets ever since. Uh, and while I can follow a pattern, I, that's just not really what I'm all about. I'm much more interested in taking something and making something of it. So that's where I sort of started from. And um, from that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of baskets. So I love this quote, weaving isn't exciting, as exciting as running around sticking things into mammoths. And that, that really is probably true. If you were a caveman, that's a lot more interesting, right? Going out, being a hunter gatherer, but somebody had to take care of gathering sticks for fire, gathering water, uh, gathering food of some kind. And so we know in looking for evidence of woven artifacts that they've been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I, find, I just find that to be fascinating. So even small pieces of clay show evidence of woven goods. Weaving really isn't just, it's just an organized bunch of sticks, right? It's really just a lot of sticks all put together, intertwined, and so they don't come apart. But why did we, why did we want to do this? Um, as far as researchers can tell, that woven items were used as utilitarian items. Probably in the cave, it, it wasn't as important to have a wall hanging for the beauty as it was to keep the drafts out. Um, but we know that uh, woven items can be uh, made of braided or twisted fibers to make mats, to make hangings, to make cordage. And we know that baskets were used uh, to carry things, to winnow grain. They were lined with clay or with pitch, pine pitch, to hold water. We know if you really believe that Moses was put in a basket made of bulrushes and floated down the river, somehow it had to be made watertight so it didn't, uh, it didn't sink. So we know, and we know that woven mats could have been used to cover the mud floor of a hut or even cover like that wall opening. Basic structure is made, can be made of woven sticks. We think of the thatch roofs on a thatched hut, palm leaves, you've seen palm leaves kind of intertwined and interspersed across sort of a bunch of sticks to create a shelter or some sort of roof. And all of these types of ideas that we think of, even like the pergola outside on a patio with woven sticks or vines going across it, lead us to believe that all of these things can be used and intertwined for basic structure. So how do we how did how did the people in the prehistoric days get their weaving materials? So they gathered them from their local environment. You can look outside now and you can see grasses, cattails animals, maybe they use the animal hair if it was longer, animal hide, maybe shaved wood strips, vines, really anything pliable or bendable that could be intertwined. So what do we use today? We do the same thing. We look outside and we use grasses, pine straw, um, shaved wood strips, vines, but we also have plastic and paper. If you look at your woven wicker outdoor furniture, sometimes it's actually plastic and it's literally plastic coated wire and it's woven together just like any other woven item, but it's plastic and metal. So right now we don't have to go out and search it ourselves. Primarily, we can use mail order and someone else prepares material. This picture, is actually people in Philippines or Malaysia organizing rattan vines. So what is the most commonly used material for weaving baskets? And that is rattan. 
It is, uh, as you can see on the picture on the right, a really long vine. It grows hundreds of feet. It grows in Malaysia or the Philippines. And you can also see in the other pictures, it has a lot of really strong spikes. So I have to imagine that while I thought, oh, rattan, rattan, what, you know, who cares about rattan? Somebody's putting their life on the line to harvest these vines and make them usable. So rattan is actually, the, the reed that we used is made of rattan. It's really milled from the pith. It can be milled into really long pieces. It's milled in many shapes. It can be flat, round, oval, flat on one side, rounded on the other, and what have you. It's easily soaked. It's also easily dyed and easily shaped. I don't use molds. Some people do use molds. Uh, the Nantucket Lightship Baskets are all made on molds. Most, if not all of my items are free-formed. So what's the next most commonly used material? I would say in the world, it's willow. In America, it's not as common. Um, but it is a very traditional um, material to use for weaving utilitarian or artsy baskets. It grows in a variety of colors. It's also um, the basket willow itself is called Salix tiandra, and there are some other varieties of that, but in, in Western Europe, they actually call it basket willow. And it is in Europe, the traditional material for making baskets. Um, it is specially grown for that. It is long lasting. It's not snappy. Um, in Northern America, the growing regions are not here in the, in the zones in the South. It grows in the upper United States and Canada, like Vermont, Washington, Oregon, uh, Idaho, and uh, up in there. Um, the, in the willow that I use is willow from England. I have used some of the uh, domestic American willow, but I find that the English willow is more predictable in its soaking. And simply because I believe they've cultivated it for that over uh, many years and lots of time. So it is related to weeping willow or creek willow that I've heard people talk about around here, but those willows are snappy and they really don't dry as well as the uh, Western European willow. Other materials, I wanted to put this in here because oak split baskets are a, a well-known type of basket. There have been makers in this area for quite some time. These are two of my baskets. I do collect these. I find them at estate sales or yard sales. They're definitely rustic. They're not perfect. They're made to be used in the farms and the gardens. And I hear tell there was a little man in Greensboro that used to make those bigger size baskets, put them in the back of his truck and drive them around and sell them to the farmers. They are very rough, but they are strips made of an oak branch or oak tree. So are all baskets made the same way? I know you've seen, um, as my daughter says, world market mom. Um, you know, if you go in World Market or go anywhere, you see containers made of in a lot of different ways. Um, this prehistoric basket is a coiled basket, and you can see that because you kind of see the bunches of the fibers, and you see what it looks like sewing. And I will tell you that plated baskets, the very first type, is um, what I think of as braided cord. And normally, like the two baskets on the outer edges, you take a braided piece and you sew them to the lower row. I'm not big on sewing, but that is a technique. People do it, they love it. Um, also, that is a palm branch that is woven. That sort of angled weave is also sometimes called plated. Coiled baskets are very common. That is a pine straw basket and the one on the right is a sweet grass basket, which you'll find around Charleston. Uh, pine straw, you can find, especially down here, the longleaf pine straw, you can have 10 to 11 inch, 12 inch pine straw pieces. Again, these are a lot of sewing. That's probably the only sweet grass basket I'll ever make. Ribbed baskets, that is a standard traditional European style. It was brought to the Appalachians and used as working baskets. 
and the, the shape of the ribs dictates the shape of the basket. And you, I'll show you later what we really mean by ribbed baskets since it's a little hard to see in these pictures. And then wicker baskets. This is your standard basic over, under, over, under. And I tell people, if you can say that, you can weave a basket. Um, this shows you sort of a round base. You can see on the left-hand side, the stakes that come out of that base. It is a continuous form and it is uh, by and large hand-shaped. But you see this sort of wicker as a name in a way or a term. It doesn't necessarily talk about the material per se, but you'll see this traditional wicker weaving in porch furniture, mirror frames, and a lot of round baskets. It's probably the most common form using the round reed. Um, I don't know if we have any questions at this point, but that's sort of the overview of basket weaving before I show demonstration items later. Um, and I think we now have a quick break to look at highlights of our craft auction. Thank you, Beth. Um, I believe Grace is going to, if I can find her. Um, I'm here. There she is. I was trying to spotlight you. Uh, so I believe Grace is going to do some, just to highlight a few auction items before we hop into the next info that Beth is going to share with us. Yeah, so today we thought we'd highlight just a few of the items that are a little different because they're considered fine craft as opposed to the highlights we've done earlier this week that have been more about sculpture and um, painting and drawing. So a few highlights. The first, speaking of weaving or knitting a work of art, uh, we have a beautiful hand knit afghan. It's item number 101 by Hazel Bloomberg McKee. This cozy throw blanket was um, knitted of wool, mohair, acrylic, and glitter yarn. So it's an interesting combination of materials. Um, another beautiful fiber piece is a large batik quilt. Um, it's auction item number 144, and it's by Wendy Adams. Um, and of course, Wendy is a very prolific and talented quilter from Havana, who's been involved with us for quite a while. Um, batik is a technique of wax, uh, using wax resist dyes on fabric. It's been around since Egyptian times and used to wrap mummies. But the process has been practiced across most of the continents in China, Japan, Nigeria, and Senegal. And this diamond pattern in purples and pinks will liven up any bedroom. Another fine craft that's been around since Egyptian times is glass, uh, whether it's vessels or blown glass or stained glass, as you see in windows. Um, this medium has delighted people across continents for many centuries. Um, this piece is a fused glass bowl by Cheryl Sattler, who is an artist living in Quincy. Number 175 is the auction item. Um, and this piece is covered with um, crushed glass and edged with iridicized glass. It gives it that um, sparkling jewel-like quality, and it's crisscrossed with multicolored iridized, iridized, iridized glass, sorry, had trouble with that word, um, reminiscent of star maps and constellations. So it's, it's a neat design. Um, Cheryl's been known to take a hammer to a sheet of freshly made glass and then refire the shards to create her gravity-defying crystalline worlds. She experiments constantly and has never found a rule she didn't want to break. Um, and if you see this piece in the gallery in the preview and you walk around it, it's really neat to see the combination of sort of geometric shape and organic form and also to see the light come through it, which gives it all sorts of different um, dimensions. We also have two other glass pieces um, that are made of vitreous enamel. And Issa spoke a little bit about this at an earlier presentation, but that is um, vitreous enamel is powdered glass that is used usually on a copper base and then fused with heat. And oftentimes the color is applied in many layers. So you get this beautiful translucent quality. Um, on the left, auction item number 139 is by Kathleen Wilcox. And the piece on the right is by Jay Hool. Both of these pieces are created um, using this ancient art form, um, again, of fusing ground glass to metal and um, firing it in a kiln at temperatures of up to 1500 degrees. 
So the fine detail, especially that you see in these pieces is, is very difficult to achieve. It takes a tremendous amount of patience, but one of the neat things about this art form is it's very durable. These images will literally last for thousands of years. I'm um, speaking of firing pieces in kilns. We have several ceramic pieces in the auction up to up for grabs. Um, this powerful sculpture number 108 in the auction is by award winning ceramic artist Barbara Balser. Um, it, it's almost three feet tall and of this piece Barbara remembers that while working as a young waitress, my drunk boss told me I was cleaning a counter wrong. I quit that day, returned to school, and eventually became a lawyer, even becoming a law review editor. Over the years, I witnessed similar displays of gratuitous power. This work is intended to playfully invert the power structure embedded in the Greek myth of Leda and the Swan, found in Ovid's Metamorphosis. The artist gives a fascinating explanation in more detail about this piece that you can read by going on our auction website and you'll click on the image, it'll pop up in a larger window and, and you can read more about what she has to say. Um, this piece reminds me of one of the reasons to collect and decorate your home with art. And that is um, art can not only speak to you and capture what you treasure and have colors or designs that match your sofa, but art can also be a fantastic conversation starter. Um, when you have guests over, which we all hope to do again sometime soon. Um, it's, it's neat to have a house full of conversation pieces and this certainly would be one. So those are a few of our fine craft items in the auction and back to you, Anissa. Thank you, Grace. Um, so I believe Beth now is going to show us something really special. Um, she's going to share with us some info about chair caning. Thank you. I just use the general term chair caning to imply reseating chairs because there's really several different techniques and they don't all use cane, but it's the simplest thing to start with. Um, and I will tell you working on chairs is the most overwhelmingly satisfying thing I do. It's, um, it, it, I can't even describe it. I love it that much. Um, I did look into a little history on chair caning, since I really don't know any. Um, and they apparently, archaeologists have discovered caned tombs in e caned chairs in Egyptian tombs. Now that's fascinating to me. Hundreds of years back, someone was figuring out how to cane an item to sit on. Or this is apparently King Tutankhamun's foldable bed. So that's pretty awesome. The chair caning, we talked about rattan before. The cane is actually the outer bark of the rattan vine. And the rattan vine is a, uh, we think about our palm trees in the back, you know, it's kind of hollow in the middle. The, the rattan is not, but they are related. Um, so they do use that pith for the, for the regular reed and then they use the outer bark for cane. We always say shiny side up. Um, you can use rush which today we have a fiber rush, which is actually literally twisted brown paper bags um, or a, a natural rush, which is twisted seagrass. Or if I was brave enough to go into the Quincy Creek and harvest cattails, if they were long enough, I could rush a chair with the cattails. That is literally what was used to rush a chair. And we have a couple different uh, methods for caning chairs. And let me actually not, not forget, we can also cane a chair or reseat a chair with shaker tape or think about your pool furniture, that really heavy plastic rubbery strapping, that can be used as well. When you boil it, you use it hot. It stretches like a rubber band. So I've done that too. But let's talk about the differing methods of chair caning. So the really common one we think of is called strand cane or chair caning. And these break all the time because they're older. It's an older form. It's told or you can determine that it's strand caning by finding the little holes around the edge. You can see them pretty carefully on the left hand side. Um, it's called a seven step process because you crisscross those canes seven times. Uh, and actually the seventh is the little binder cane that goes around the outside that you sort of 
lace onto the chair to give it a finished look. And the chair on the right is a little chair that I was given just because somebody didn't want to cane it and um, I did. So it's the trick to it is keeping your strands of cane just wet enough. Not too wet, not too, not wet. They get really hairy and they crack, but to just do it just right. So strand caning is really one of my favorite kinds um, and it is an older form. The press cane came along a little later. Um, the factory made chairs. They realized that the longest time it took to make a chair was that strand caning. So they developed a way to create sheets of woven cane and then just cut a little groove in the chair. And you see that chair on the left, it's got that nice groove in it. And it's really a little bit of a bear to clean out. Um, there's a lot of glue that goes into that, that uh, groove, but then you wet your sheet of cane and you press it in very carefully so you don't break it. And then there's a nice little shaped reed that goes around it called spline. You can kind of see it on those right hand chairs and it also is what holds the glue and the pressed cane in there after you've trimmed everything up. Um, it's a lot of fun to do, actually. It's just a lot more prep work on the pressed cane. Rushing is more commonly done with the fiber rush, which is the twist, twisted craft paper. I don't know how they do it, but it's you buy an entire spool of 10 pounds of this stuff and very rarely can you find a uh, a knot or a join. It's um, pretty durable. You wanna shellac it when you're done and it, it probably lasts for about 50 years. You can see the chair on the left was dry rotted. That, that rushing had dry rotted and was falling out of the chair. And I did a set of six beautiful, probably 50s maple chairs that went with a kitchen set. Um, you can see they have this iconic triangular shape and you weave toward the middle. And then when you get to the middle, the place that's shown open there, that's called the bridge. And you have to work with a hammer and a small wedge to keep that bridge open enough to get all the final strips in. And then they're finished. Um, and that's sort of what the, they looked like on the right when they were, at least three or four of the maple chairs were done and then another one was finished as well. Porch, porch chairs tend to weather. They sit outside, they're, they're painted so they'll weather a little better, but after a while, just like anything, it gets brittle. And so the seats, the seats break. The porch weave is really more of a pattern and I'm showing you sort of the white chair in process. It's sort of almost like a warp on your loom and then you do these two strips across and it's, it's an iconic weave for porch chairs, which is why it's called porch weave. The other uh, method of chair caning, and this one's a little harder to see, is a herringbone. And it's really, it's more of a pattern. Again, it's sort of a staggered over three, under three type pattern that you change up every, every row, so to speak. Um, but it also creates a really interesting pattern on your woven areas. Some of the chairs that I get are mysteries. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, this chair came to me and they said, we bought this in Key West probably 30 years ago, thinking we'd do something with it. And well, we just didn't quite get to it. We didn't know anybody that did caning. And we thought, just see, we wanted to see if you could do it. And I never backed down from a challenge. So I took it on and, and I, I looked it over. I really looked it over. The frame was really solid. But it was a mystery chair. What is this chair? One chair. I've never seen a chair like this. It had press cane panels in the, in the seat in the back. It had a wrought iron frame that was really in good shape, just very, very, very rusted. And the finished work on the wood looked like it was done in a factory. It was really perfectly done and it had sort of a spatter technique on top of it. There was no maker's mark but there was a little slight hint of frame color. And you can kind of see that in that smaller left-hand frame or left-hand picture, it was a little bit silvery. So I thought, what is this? And I looked on the internet and I found it. This was, these chairs were made in two different colors by Drexel Heritage. I didn't get a date on it, but probably again, 
50s, maybe early 60s. It was done in a beautiful cream color with a burnished gold or a coppery sort of frame color. The table had a marble inset. And then it was also made in brown. So I, I would assume that it was sort of a cafe set. And there might have been a brown table to go with the brown colored chairs. And those chairs had a beautiful, soft, silver pewter frame. So I worked with the customer and they, we all said, I, I just can't get that pewter out of my head. So after many, many coats of navel jelly and a lot of um, washing and sanding of the frame, this is what we came up with. And that's what it looked like when I got done. I was pretty impressed, impressed with that chair. I think, I think it really knew what it was doing. It is gorgeous. Thanks. And then I had another mystery chair. And, and if Grace doesn't mind, I, I believe what she told me was, this was my grandmother's chair. It's been sitting in the corner for a while. And it's, you know, it really needs some TLC. And this is not unusual. When I get a chair, it's usually broken. It's, it's you know, busted. You can see this is natural rush. And you can see as with any plant material, it's degraded, it's, it's snapped, it's broken. This one doesn't have cardboard stuffing in it like we would do a, a rush seat today. It had thin pieces of wood. And underneath the chair, which I'm sorry, I didn't get a picture of before I took it all apart, you could see the ends of the natural rush. There's a, a method that you can see how the hand takes the ends and you trim them up and everything anyway. But we knew, I knew a few things about this chair. That was a real rush seat. It had skirted sides. The skirts are those little tiny pieces of wood around the chair seat. And I thought, man, how am I gonna get that rush through there and keep the tension I need to do? And then I realized I could just take a screwdriver and just very gently and easily put, take those off. And as I was doing this chair, I posted on Instagram, a chair caner that I follow, and I sort of use air quotes, I say that I'm friends with, because I do have conversations with other uh, professional chair caners. They said, oh, a Hitchcock chair. And I thought, wow, what's that? I mean, it had distinctive shapes. The, the wood had a beautiful patina, but again, no maker's mark. So I looked up Hitchcock chair. And look at these chairs. The middle one, the red one, is actually the shape of the chair that I was working on with the, the middle part of the back a little bit arched in the middle. But look at the painting on those chairs. Now those all have real rush seats and um, they've got a lot of decorative painting. Hitchcock was a Connecticut company that started in the 1800s. So I suspect the chair that Grace has is not that old. And also there was no evidence of it having been painted. But if you'll go to the next slide, I'll show you a little bit more of the Hitchcock chair. This, um, this was done in a natural rush, which is a twisted seagrass, which I thought just made it look beautiful. Uh, you can see the stuffing in it, we call it of the cardboard. That stuffing actually keeps the material from rubbing on the rails of the chair. So your wear, wear is a little more evenly done and you're not gonna wear it out as quickly. But once it was done, I was able to clean it up and put a little furniture polish on it. And I just think it looked fabulous. I was, I was so, so overwhelmed and stunned with the look of that chair. Again, I think it, know, it knew what it was doing when it let me work on it. Um, I think I'm over with uh, the chair caning part. And um, I do wanna mention though that I love every one that I do. They're, each one is unique, they're fascinating. They all have their own personalities. They all have a story. And, and I think maybe that's why I like the chairs so much is because of the story that comes with them. So I might be a little bit early on this portion. Um, do we want to take questions? Do we have any questions right now? So I don't see, oh, I do see one. Um, how long does it take to make a basket or restore a chair? Um, and how do you find time for your day job? <laughs> well, that's, it's a really good question. Um, I do start out by telling people 
when they give me chairs that I do work full time and um, it will take me a while. And I appreciate everybody's patience on that. Um, I do it in the evenings. I do it on the weekends. I'm somewhat obsessed in that I have a lot of nervous energy. And so I take my materials with me. Sometimes when I'm going places and I can just, it's like people sit and knit. I sometimes just sit and weave or I'm thinking of a design or something I wanna do. A basket like this takes, takes hours. Um, a, even a basket like this takes hours. It just, I, I can't even, it's a really good question. It takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's all I can say. Do you tend to spend like, you know, an extended, you know, a whole day working on one or do you kind of pick it up and, you know, keep working on it over time? Well, that's like a really, that's like true confessions. <laughs> uh, I tend to have about 10 going at any one time. Wow. And there are times that I look around and I count them and I can't figure out why. I, I'm really good at beginning, but I, I really struggle with that ending thing. And um, I sometimes have to just like stop everything and then like do a whole session where I'm finishing all different kinds. And because I don't have a lot of patience, I tend to weave a lot of different kinds of baskets. So I, thank you for bringing out that guilty secret. Um, I do have a very patient husband and my patient family. So I, I do appreciate that because I also tend to sort of start taking over things. Um, I talked about, is that, am I good to go on or do we have another? Yep, you can keep going. I, uh, I talked about the rattan being milled in different sizes. And I don't know if you can really see this, but we have a little, let's see, that's a really thick one. And then that's a really teeny tiny thin one. And so I would take like this, you wanna sort of gauge it to the size you're weaving. This little bitty egg basket has little teeny tiny, probably double zero round reed in it. And then chair cane for the caning because it's tiny. Whereas this guy probably has number seven or number six reed in it, which is the size. It, it's really sort of a comparative um, size, but much bigger. The um, tools that I use are always interesting. I have my Boy Scout knife, which is really sharp. So I do appreciate that. I use regular scissors. I have some super sharp snippers because the willow is literally sticks like you're clipping things off a tree. I use a regular screwdriver, but it's kind of a small blade so I can get in places. This is called a wrapping iron and it is, I'm trying to show these so it looks best, but you can see it. It is literally a forged piece of metal. And I use it in the willow baskets because I need that heft. I need the strength to be able to hold things down. Um, and then this is called a tallow horn. It is a cow horn. It has um, cheesecloth in it soaked in tallow. And then I have, these are called bodkins. And if this wasn't a nice table, I could probably drive it in. They are that sharp, but they come in different sizes so that you can ease them in the basket and make your space a little bit bigger. And I'll put some uh, stakes in a willow basket in just a minute. So I want to show you when I'm weaving a willow base, the first thing I do is take sticks and I've um, soaked my willow for as many days at it as the feet that it is tall. So if we look back here, I have six foot willow. If I'm using six foot willow, I have to soak it for six days and then I let it mellow for a day in a plastic bag or under under uh, wet cloths, the, um, and then I can use it. So for those baskets, I will weave all day because once it gets dry, it's dry. And it's very hard to bring it back. Um, when I'm working on willow, I started this basket to show you, this is actually called buff willow. Again, my daughter says world market mom. Um, but it is not. This is actually a traditional willow grown in the Somerset levels of England. They boil it and peel it. So the, the peel the, actually colors this and it is, um, you can hear it, it is more, 
it's sort of drier and I don't know how to describe it. It's just a real different thing. But I'm gonna go ahead and put in the last couple steaks and show you normally this stuff just flops down. So I think it's drying already since I put it together this morning. But I wanna make a space for the steak. I'm going to put it in the space. Sometimes I have to use one of these little rubbery grabbers because my hands get wet or it gets um, done. And then I'm going to do what's called pricking up the steaks. I make a little spot with my knife and I twist it and it actually kind of breaks the rod in half, but it gives me enough when it's wet uh, resilience that the, doesn't break it completely through. Um, I also have the ends. You probably can't see it. I'm trying to see. They're called sliced. You can kind of see that it's white. I've taken my knife and I've carved it into sort of a point. And that is a standard traditional willow technique called slicing the steaks. Um, I do this on my kitchen table. Um, and luckily, it doesn't clear off too many things when I'm doing it. It's uh, a little bit much when I'm trying to flip it around and these six foot stakes are uh, flopping about the kitchen. The, um, the first thing that I would do is then gather it all up and then there's a method to start weaving around the bottom. And I'm not going to do all that today because it, it really would take a while and I want to just give you the idea of how we do it. But once you get the bottom started and you start going up the sides, I have weights. I sometimes use a five pound bag of flour. I now have some old irons, the sad irons, and I have some larger weights to use. And that'll help keep my basket straight and stiff and carefully you know, in place while I weave up the sides. And this is what that will look like when I get it done. This is a standard typical laundry basket with a, I'll show you the base, a standard round base, just like we do with round, little round baskets and um, everything else. It is, a, it is a Western European style, this round base. The ribs, we talked about rib baskets. I like to use, um, the vines that I find in the local environment. I think that makes them a whole lot more interesting. I'm not big on hoops, uh, pre-made hoops. This is grapevine and you can sort of see the shape in it. Uh, probably can't see it really close, but there are these nice tendrils that stick out. And the, these ribs are what give this basket its shape. So it's gonna be sort of a bowl. Um, when I put them on, I lay them out and I sort of start looking at it and I'm wondering, well, how, how deep do I want to make it? How shallow do I want to make it? Is it big? Is it small? What color do I want to use in this end piece? I call this the fan, where you can start sort of weaving down here and adding on your round read because you have smaller spaces. And then you'll sort of graduate into um, flatter read. And this is a little tiny basket made with a wisteria rim, just a tiny little wisteria rim. And it starts with a little tiny round reed and it goes into a tiny flat reed. I actually had to cut these in half to make it work. But just a little round vine like this that I twisted around makes the rim. This is a honeysuckle uh, rim and that will make just a shallow, small bowl basket. You can see the colors. So where do you go to find these like rims? Do you just walk around? Um, I, they, they grow a whole lot of, everywhere here in North Florida. They grow at the roadsides. They grow in my backyard. Um, grapevine, it's pretty common. It's really everywhere. They're just a native wild plant. So that's, so I like those. 
It's interesting Um, that you're, you know, working with what you find, because that's one of the things that Kay talked about in her floral presentation earlier was going to her backyard and, you know, working with these materials that are just there. So I think that's really cool. The, um, and that's what I wanted to show you. I do also point the ends, I'm trying to figure out where it shows up best, but point the ends like a pencil of the reed, and then I will stick it in sort of where I think I want it to go. And then you sort of start measuring and looking and saying, okay, well, it fits right here. I don't want it out. I want it sort of here. I want it to sort of help continue my shape. Uh, So these ribbed baskets do take a little bit longer because you're always um, making sure your shape is right. You're whittling the ends of the reed and putting it all together. Once you get to the time that you can part in the basket where you can start doing the flat read, it goes really fast. But the shaping of this is really key. Um, For the materials that you find in nature, uh, do you have to like cure them or do anything before you work with them? That is a really interesting question. Um, When I find the vines, I coil them up right away. If I wait, they'll be too stiff and you'll just end up breaking it. So I have to spend a little time that day when I finally pick things to go ahead and loop it up and get it in the right shape. Um, especially the honeysuckle, it'll just snap and break if, if you don't, and the wisteria too. Um, using natural elements, that's what I wanted to talk about. So that was a good segue, thank you very much. I had a, I had a, um, special order lately that said, I really want a bedside table, well, a side table basket. Make it, you know, 16 or 18 inches across. I said, okay, well, and and use grapevine. So I thought, well, what does that mean? I I don't know what that means. Can you send me a picture? So she sent me a picture and it was literally a flat basket with little flat sides with legs on it. And I said, okay, with grapevine. And so I really thought about it and, and I, I really thought about it and I sort of flailed away at the idea for a while. And then I thought, wait a minute, why don't, she said, I need to have it flat so I can put a glass of water in it and a book. So I thought, well, why am I doing this? Why don't I just use willow? I can make willow, I can make it flat. And here's this round shape again. I can make it flat. I can make a nice side on it and wait. These grapevines I have in the yard are about the same size as my willow branches. Wouldn't that be the perfect thing? So I ended up making this prototype, which I call a table basket. It's nice and flat. It sits on the table. Uh, My daughter already absconded with it and said, mom, put it on the coffee table. We put books in it and everything. It keeps things organized. But of course, my client said, well, that's kind of big because it it turned out to be about 22 inches across. So I made some more and hers ended up being exactly 15 inches across, which she went and measured. That's what she wanted for beside her bed. And she ordered legs on Amazon and then put them through the little holes in the bottom, I guess, the screws and some washers to hold them in. So I hope she doesn't, the, the chair legs or the table legs don't flex too much because I'm afraid it will break it, but um, she now has these really cool custom bedside tables that she has sent me a picture of. But this is another one, and I just thought that was really cool to see the different colors of the willow, and then that grapevine. Uh, You can see it's kind of loose. It's kind of free form. When you're close to it, you can see the tendrils of the grapevine sticking out, Uh, but this came into just being a really, really cool idea of how to blend our natural materials found locally with some traditional weaving material. Uh, Uh, There's a question related to materials. Um, Have you ever tried making a basket or a seat using, let's see, katsura, katsu, kudzu? Kudzu, I have made kudzu baskets. Yes, funny you should ask. Where I lived in Virginia, the kudzu actually dries out a certain time of the year. It's a little bit, um, goes through more of a season, I guess, there than it does here. And I did take it. It makes up great. You actually can make a nice round basket just like this out of it. And I had it for years for my onions and my potatoes in my pantry closet. Uh, 
but it, it made, a, it was a sort of a grayish brown, a very rustic sort of looking fiber uh, material. But thank you. The other, um, I wanted to also talk about willow platters. This is also, this is a platter. You can see it's got the different colors in it. That's where the, the bark has come off the willow, so it's white. This chocolatey brown color, and you see that in the back, that's called steamed willow. And it's this uh, Salix Tiandra, the black mall, that's actually steamed and its bark goes to be a chocolate. So that's kind of cool. But I, um, these are very common in England. People take willow branches and put them together to make a willow platter. And I thought, well, gee, we don't really have that kind of willow here, but why not take branches out of my backyard and that have a Y and make a platter. I mean, that's, that makes sense. It's the same thing. So this is a beautiful pear branch that was just an elegant long branch. And I do have to cut these when they're uh, freshly cut or it's very, very hard to get a nice flat clean cut. But I take um, frames made of just branches that one looks like a leaf, doesn't it? Almost like a tobacco leaf. I do take the frames out of the branches and then I will weave the willow through it. Sometimes it'll have a couple ribs to give it some shape. And then it creates a beautiful platter. Um, and if you're at a loss as to what to do with it, I would put this on a mantle and put little tea lights on it or votives. Maybe stretch some of your, uh, put your Christmas balls on it and put some garland around it. You could put it in the middle of your table at Thanksgiving time and put fruits and vegetables on it. You could serve cheese and crackers on it. There's a lot of things you can do with a beautiful natural platter like this, but I, I, I love doing these. And I find it's a great way to combine native natural elements from North Florida here with a traditional material. That is gorgeous, Beth. Um, so, so we're right about 255 right now. So I wasn't sure what you really wanted to cover before we headed out. Um, or if you wanted to, if anyone has some final questions, now would be a good time to drop them in the chat since we are getting close to that. We're trying to keep these to, you know, under an hour. We know your time is precious. Um, was there anything you really wanted to, anything extra you really wanted to share? Do I ever give classes? I see this one. I can oh, see yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, I love teaching. Thank you for asking that. It's a shameless plug. I <laughs> love teaching almost as much as I love making the baskets. And my theory is if you didn't get it right, it's my fault. Um, unfortunately, with the COVID, uh, I had a great class all set up last spring for Easter baskets in March and that one got canceled. So hopefully, um, Hopefully once things get opened up a little more, I can start having some classes. Um, I did have a garden club ask me to come teach a willow basket. And um, that one just didn't work either because everybody, uh, you know, the numbers started going up and we really, we really, none of us were really comfortable. So yes, I do. And I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping to get back to that soon. Thank you. Um, so we also have some questions about, you know, where do we buy your baskets? How do we get in contact with you if we're looking to use you for chair caning or something like that? Oh, gosh. Well, my email is artisanwillows at gmail.com. A-R-T-I-S-A-N, willows, W-I-L-L-O-W-S. And I do have a Facebook page and an Instagram page. Thanks, Vanessa. That's... Um, yeah, that's, that's it. But that's always a good thing to share. People just, people just contact me. Um, when I have a custom order, I generally make two or three because I don't know that your vision and my vision are the same, but I want to give you choices. So, um, and I just like making things. I love the challenge of a new idea and trying to use things in new ways. That's awesome. Um, well, I don't see any final question. I did. There was one earlier about finishing. How do you finish the baskets? I guess that's a good one to finish on. Oh, how do you how do you make it so you can't see all the ends and stuff? And then we'll let you we'll let you go. Um, a lot of times I leave them natural. 
This is one is natural. It was actually, um, I'm gonna tell this story. My mother put it in her attic for about 20 years. So the frame is still the same frame, but I did, the rest was all uh, brittle. So I took it out and reworked it. I actually rewove it, but the frame is the same. If you have a basket that doesn't have, you know, some kind of varnish or shellac or some kind of finish on it, you can just hose it off with a garden hose or put it in the sink for a minute or two and then let it dry. It'll kind of keep it hydrated and not get so brittle. But I typically um, don't put a finish on the cane itself. Um, the, the exception of that is when there is a dyed reed like the blue or the red or the orange that may tend to bleed. Some colors don't bleed, those really good strong primary colors do. And I would probably use a little minwax, um, okay. like a polyurethane or a, um, like a stain on it that would help seal, seal the retainer. Okay, but awesome. Yellow doesn't need anything. Awesome. Well, I think this was an awesome presentation about the, you know, art of making baskets and chair caning. Um, it's certainly something I knew very little about and now I know a lot about. Um, I love that we've gotten to see all these different types of art this week, you know, between floral design and baskets. Um, it's really is a celebration of arts, huh, Grace? It is, and, it, and it's a celebration of how these different arts can be a part of our everyday lives as well. Um, Beth, we can't thank you enough. I'm just amazed at how much energy you have to produce <laughs> all of this work in addition to working. Um, it's really amazing. And I know because you've uh, furnished us with quite a number of baskets just this week. Um, we look That's forward fine. to sharing those. And um, thank you so much for presenting today. And thank everyone again for being here with us online. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a beautiful afternoon and thank you Anissa for running another great program.